welcome to our fourth video in our series through the book of Revelation. Um, in this big section that we're looking at, 8 to 11, um, we'll see the next series of, of judgments. Last week we looked at uh, the seven seals of destiny. This week we're looking at the seven trumpets of warning. To be really helpful for you to go and read through this whole big section before we look at it together and notice some of the repetition, try and get your head around some of what we see here and spend some time praying that God would open your eyes to understand his word so that it would impact you and you'd know how to teach it to others. As I said, um, I've said it before, uh, Revelation isn't chronological as in each scene doesn't necessarily follow the next one in a line. Um, Revelation is much more like a, a cycle where the same events are, are on repeat and you're seeing them just from from different perspectives throughout the book. And in the last section we were looking at, uh, as the seals were opened, it was looking at um, suffering, but suffering that affects the whole world and does affect God's people. We saw the cry of the martyrs in that section, where these seven trumpets are much more a warning to the non-Christian world, a warning calling people to turn back to God before it's too late. As we go through, uh, we will see all the trumpets being sounded. So let me just highlight those quickly. You'll see that as we look at these trumpets, there's a big break between the sixth angel sounding his trumpet in chapter 9. Then we've got the whole of chapter 10 and half of chapter 11 before the seventh angel sounds his trumpet. And we'll have a look at that interlude between the trumpet blasts in a little while. Uh, we'll see that there are um, the seven angels who are the ones blowing the trumpets. They are God's messengers. This is happening um, God is in control here, and that's important for us to, to keep in mind. There's some other kinds of angels that are released. And then in chapter 10, we see another mighty angel. He's separated out from the other angels who are blowing the trumpets. So this is all a different angel to the ones that are blowing the trumpet. Let me get back to the seventh angel at the end of chapter 11. So there are angels blowing trumpets throughout the section. As I said, the key thing to see is that these um, trumpets are warnings from God, um, particularly for the non-Christian world. We see in chapter 8, verse 6 to the end of the chapter, um, cosmic chaos. Um, as the first four trumpets are sounded, we see the earth being affected. Um, firstly, we, we see this repetition of a third in these verses. So the cosmic chaos, we see first um, a third of the, uh, the earth is burned, the trees are burned, the grass is burned. Um, so this is the earth suffering, the world suffering um, as a result of the fall. Uh, we, we see our world in chaos. And the trumpets that are blasting, if we see them in the Old Testament, they uh, were an old... Uh, in the Old Testament, they are a warning sound, like in Ezekiel 33, um, a warning from God just showing that something's wrong with our world. Um, but it's very important to see that this is not the final judgment because this is a third. So it's a partial uh, impact as these trumpets are sounded. Um, and this is a picture of the days we're living in um, before Jesus returns there. 
there will be constant warnings of chaos, um, chaos on the earth, uh, chaos. This is seen in the sea um, and the rivers and even in the heavens. So the cosmos is in chaos here. Yeah? Um, just a note on wormwood here. Um, we see Jeremiah 9 verse 15 um, and 23 verse 15. Uh, it, it's a, a poisonous uh, root that poisons water. Um, but a lot of the imagery, as, as we've seen, is linked with um, Old Testament imagery. And the, the trumpets being blasted will also link back with um, Exodus and the different plagues that we see in Exodus. So, for example, the waters um, turning to blood um, in Exodus 7 are the waters being poisoned and people dying as a result. Uh, the, the darkness without light we see in Exodus 10, uh, verse 21 to 23, um, the plague of darkness. So, an Old Testament background helps us to see more clearly what's going on here. Something that we'll see as we keep going through is that this darkness um, actually is a, impacts people spiritually, um, which we'll see as we, we look at the fifth trumpet being sounded in a moment. But it's, it's kind of a metaphorical darkness, like the darkness of depression. But then... After we see this cosmic chaos, um, we see this angel or a vulture uh, crying out, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. Um, and what this is telling us is that it's going to get worse. And as the fifth angel sounds his trumpet, um, we see the first way in which things are going to get worse. Um, as we see spiritual torture. So this star falling from the sky, given the keys to the abyss. Remember, it's given the keys um, to the abyss. It, we're told in um, chapters 1 and 2 that Jesus is the one, or chapter 1, that Jesus is the one who holds the keys of death and Hades. And now this uh, star, which we'll see in a moment, is a picture of Satan, the destroyer. He's given the keys um, to the abyss by Jesus. So God is still in control here. Um, and then the picture uh, gets quite crazy as these locusts come out of the smoke. And these locusts, again, are an Exodus picture. Um, so Exodus 10, the plague of locusts. But also the book of Joel uh, the prophecy of Joel, where we see um, the locusts are a picture of God's judgment. And as in Joel, as in Exodus, uh, Moses calling, Mo uh, calling Pharaoh to turn back to God, Joel calling the people to heed the warning of the locust plague and turn back to God. That is the point of this plague. As this spiritual torture, these locusts aren't literal locusts. Um, as we see, they have power like scorpions here we it's hard for us to even fathom what these locusts look like with their golden crowns and human faces and woman's hair and teeth like lions it's just a john is doing his best to describe the indescribable but these are these locusts are a picture of the demonic forces that are wreaking havoc on on the world around us but it's very important for us to see that in verse 4, they could only harm those who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So the sealed of God are Christians. And these locusts are only able to um, afflict this pain and suffering on non-Christians. This word uh, torture here um, is this kind of torment is primarily um, spiritual, spiritual and psychological suffering. 
Um, and so we see here that Satan is the tormentor of those who follow him. He's a very terrible um, king to follow. So it's a very bleak picture that we're given here. If you think about um, the demon-possessed man in Mark 5, for example, you see how he was tormented and he was cutting himself among the tombs. Um, it's not a good thing to be under the control of Satan. And so we've seen cosmic chaos and spiritual torture. And then as the sixth trumpet sounds, uh, we see um, death. It's a plague of death as um, these angels are able to kill a third of mankind we see here. Um, and this is primarily talking about um, it's lots of different kinds of death, but death that comes too soon. All death is a result of the fall and all people will die. But this is specifically talking about the fact that a third of mankind, so not all, but a lot of people will die um, prematurely early. And the devastating effects of that should act on our world like a trumpet sound, warning us that there is something wrong with our world. And so that is what these uh, six trumpets are doing. They are a warning to the world to tell the world to turn back to God. The terrible news that we see in verse 20 is that we are told that they did not repent. Those who hadn't been killed. So this is the non-Christian world, those who haven't been sealed, um, and those who were left alive, they didn't repent. They didn't stop their idolatry. They didn't repent of their murders and their magic arts and sexual immorality and thefts. Um, which is a, a really sad picture that we're given. Even the warning of death um, doesn't cause them to turn back. And then in chapter 10 we get to an interlude that takes us right through chapter 10, um, most of the way through chapter 11 as well. In this interlude, we see this mighty angel coming down from heaven. Um, he's holding a little scroll. And what we'll see in a moment is that this little scroll um, is the gospel message. And what chapter 10 shows us is that um, we are sealed in order to bear witness. So we're protected. What we're meant to be doing in these days is to make the gospel known. There's a strange little uh, section here, uh, verse 4. When the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write... But I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Um, lots of people have then speculated, oh, what, what is this all about? I think it's important for us to know that in, uh, in God's word, so Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 tells us that there are secret things. The secret things are, of God are things that we cannot know. We, won't, we can't get our heads around but what we are told is for our good. And so whatever the seven thunders said, um, we just need to trust that we don't need to know that. God has given us everything that we need to know um, to live for him in this world. We're told here that um, there will be no more delay. The seventh trumpet is about to sound. But during these days, um, the mystery of God will be accomplished. And this is really good news. Um, this mystery we read about, for example, in um, Colossians 1. The mystery is uh, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is the message of the gospel. And this mystery will be accomplished um, just as, as he announced to his servants, the prophets, um, and then John is told, take the scroll, uh, which we saw uh, is the message of the gospel. So this little scroll. 
take the little scroll. It's the message of the gospel. And he's told to eat it, to consume it. He needs this the, the message of the gospel to be in him. He's told that it will be as sweet as honey, but it will also turn his stomach sour. And so we see here the bittersweet effects of the gospel. As we accept it, it is sweet to know the salvation that is ours, but it will be sour as well because it will cause us to suffer as we make this gospel message known. And then at the end of chapter 10, I was told, you must prophesy again. So this is a call to preach the gospel again to people, nations, languages, and kings. And we, we've already seen these people, nations, languages, and kings gathered before the throne, um, singing praise to the Lamb. That is what the gospel does. It calls people from different places to be a part of God's forever kingdom. And so John is told that he needs to make this news known again. So even though the warnings have sounded and people haven't repented at the end of chapter 9, the good news is that we are called as God's sealed people to keep preaching this message. And as we preach, God works through his word to call people to himself. Now, chapter 11, um, we are given a, a further description in this interlude where we meet these two witnesses, these two prophets. Um, again, we see some numbers, so 126 days and um, three and a half years or 42 months. Uh, both of those are three and a half years, so a half of seven. It's a long but not eternal time. Um, this is the same time frame that represents the church age that we're living in right now. And so this description is just a further description of what will um, happen in these days that we're living in now. So this is still in the interlude. And again, uh, good Old Testament knowledge will help us to get our heads around what's going on here. Uh, these two olive trees we meet in uh, Zechariah verse 11 to 14 um, and then the picture that we're given here they have the power to shut up the heavens so that it won't rain during the time they're prophesying who does that sound like uh, that sounds like Elijah in the book of Kings um, and then they have the power to turn waters into blood to strike the earth with every kind of plague who does that sound like that sounds like Moses so here we have um, Moses and Elijah. They represent the Old Testament to us. These are um, the law and the prophets. And so here we have uh, the law and the prophets. We've had uh, this little scroll, which is the gospel message. The picture that we're being given in this whole interlude is that um, this preaching, this the law and the prophets, so the Old Testament and the gospel, the New Testament, this all needs to be made known in these days. But it won't be easy because we see in verse 7, um, when they had finished their testimony, so they had kept preaching faithfully, the beast that comes from the abyss, so we've seen that's a picture of Satan, he comes and overpowers and kills them. And their bodies are left in that great city, um, it's called here Sodom and Egypt, but then it says where the Lord was crucified. So this is Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem has proved to be just as hostile to God as Sodom and Egypt were. But uh, even though they were killed, this is not the end. Because after three and a half days, so after a time, the breath of life from God entered them again. Uh, they are raised to life. They are called up to heaven and they are glorified. And then we see at that very hour an earthquake comes, severe earthquake. Uh, this is an indication that the seventh trumpet is really about to be sounded. This is the end of the world as we know it. Um, earthquakes are often a sign of God's judgment. Haggai 2 verse 
uh, 7 is an example of that. Uh, we see this earthquake again here. So after the interlude, the second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. And as this final trumpet sounds, we know uh, the time has come. It's too late to repent now. The warnings are over. And Jesus has conquered. That's what we see in these final verses. Uh, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. So um, if Jesus is now ruling on earth, it means that judgment has happened and eternity with God has been ushered in. He will reign forever and ever. Um, his reign has begun. But we also see that it's the time of God's wrath for judging the dead um, and for rewarding his servants, the prophets. So right at the end of this big section, we do see that those who follow Jesus um, will be rewarded by him, will be safe with him forever. I'm just trying to get our heads around this whole big section. So as these the first six trumpets are sounding, what this section was telling John, what it should be telling us is that all the suffering in this world, the suffering that non-Christians face particularly, should be should act as a warning to them to turn back to God before it's too late. By the time the seventh trumpet sounds, when Jesus returns, when his forever kingdom will be fully and finally ushered in, um, at that time, those who have been sealed, who belong to, to God, um, will be safe and with him forever. But judgment will happen. For us as Christians, we need to use this opportunity to um, add our voices to the suffering around us and tell people that this is not how this world was meant to be and this is not how this world will always be. And so this is calling us to tell all the world of Jesus and call people to turn back to him. And as this little scroll, the gospel message is preached, as the law and the prophets of the Old Testament is preached, all of that is calling people to be a part of God's forever kingdom. And we need to be praying that God in his mercy would um, use the warnings of the trumpets, would use our gospel preaching to call many people back to him. So as you dig further into this um, big section, pray that God would help you to understand it so that you'd be able to teach it to others well. God bless.